if you're someone who doesn't feel good on testosterone anthate, then sipinate is still a valid drug. It's just not going to do the exact same thing when you're looking at mm -hmm. like dosing of how much muscle you're going to gain. So it's possible that maybe an anthate would cause a higher peak. Little Talking about introducing in. something that my segue before, but I got to interrupt it. Kurt, um, you were working on a study comparing the efficacy of sipionate versus uh, the efficacy of mm -hmm. anthate. That study is pretty much done. People have been asking me, where's the update? Where's the update? Where's the update? Not understanding that peer review and submission and, and publication takes a long time. And if you want to get the good data, you need months of administration yep. for this data to be valid. Not only one person, but multiple people. So can you spill a little bit sure. of information? So yeah. Background, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the background was... We were comparing the pharmacokinetics of testosterone cypionate to testosterone enanthate. And it was not to discourage the use of cypionate. It was just to show that they're not the same thing, that they're not you necessarily, wanted to tank the stock, not necessarily I get it. interchangeable. <laughs> um, and what we did is a graded dose. So it was, it was pharmaceutical grade of both, and it was administered by a physician. So there's no self-administration. We didn't want anyone measuring or weighing anything because people can't clearly do that. And the two doses we used were 300 milligrams and 600 milligrams of each because we wanted to see a real effect. Um, and it turns out that Cipionate has a much lower peak in serum in most individuals. There were some we didn't see, but the vast majority, it just, it, you can show that. I sent you that that image. Do you have no, it's okay. Save that for the study. Um, it just yeah, has a much it. slower rise and peak. And then testosterone and anthate basically ramps up much faster. Right. Um they hold the half life seems about the same, but testosterone and anthate seem to cause a much higher uh, peak in the serum. Uh, All right. So, if you're someone who doesn't feel good on testosterone and anthate, then sipinate is still a, a valid drug. It's it's just not going to do the exact same thing, right? If you're, I hate to say muscle gain would be effective, right? But peak in serum is is a valid metric when you're looking at mm -hmm. like dosing of how much muscle you're going to gain. So it's possible that maybe an anthate would cause a higher peak. Something I think people also should look at when you look at the Bayesian studies with testosterone, that is, it's done differently than most people assume. Again, cherry picking data. If you, if you actually look at the administration, he gave the dose in one shot a week. So the 600 milligram group got 601 shots. So the peak was much higher. And that probably contributed to that much more massive amount of growth than if they microdosed it. Right. So again, if you're if you're concerned with side effects and estrogen, things like that, microdosing things can make sense. Or if you just want to keep things very stable. But if you want to really leverage an effect out of something, right, you want a higher peak serum. Yeah. So that's what he did. And I, a lot of it was done because you're not going to get people to show up to your office three times a week to get them injections. So it was easier just to give it in one big shot. But that being said, when you look at the numbers in those studies, that's how it was administered. Uh, so for your study, did they come in once a week or twice a week twice. or three times a week? Tried to keep it twice. In twice. Okay. We just split the dose yeah. in half. I figured that with those esters, that's totally a fine way to administer it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it was split in half. So 300 was 150 twice a week and the 600 was 300 twice a week. Um, and it's all uh, in, in the glute or other administration sites? Glute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's the most stable absorption spot. Like that's, we were just shoulders. trying to eliminate any possible variable, right? Different size shoulders, different, you know, activity levels. Glute is... For the average person, your glute's just going to be moved a lot more around during the day than, than the shoulder. Yeah. That's probably why the absorption, it's a bigger muscle, but it's probably just because people move, right? Versus shoulder, if you sit all day, you're probably not getting as much activity there. Um, right. And we're, we were thinking about doing a second part. We open it up to even a broader group and see if we can get okay. a larger study. Um, but yeah, I thought so it was neat. So what we're going to do is when this study is out, we should cover it in depth sure. because that gets that gets views. And then more views on these studies should guarantee bigger funding. That's why I usually help Tim Pietkowski with some of his studies because there, you get more eyes on these studies and then there's a demand and then there's more potential funding for follow-up studies. So by all means, we should just address it in an entire episode when it's uh, peer-reviewed and ready for publication. Correct. And then uh, and they will, will really go through it in depth um, because it's cool um, to see the results. Yeah. Like you showed me a little bit of results, and it's it's a clear difference. Um, like what Dean pointed out uh, regarding sexual, sexual binding globulin, globulin depletion. That was <laughs> that's that's that that's was, a steep reduction. Pretty cool. The um, but, yeah, without going into your results, Kurt. I mean, it was just night and day difference. You know, 
do dosage is held the same, just swapping the ester to speak. Um, that SHBG f falling dramatically was, uh, in theory, then it might show premise that if someone wanted to control SHBG better, SIP might be a better compound. But my takeaway yep. from that, that data was bioavailability of SIP, knowing that free testosterone as well lowers SHBG, is a lot lower with testosterone sipiny, which is which is incredible to prove. Right. How 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 are the estrogen levels comparing sipiny? Oh, we sipinate? have more. Uh, yeah, relatively okay. similar. That wasn't it wasn't similar. Okay. Yeah. So uh, two things about the study. So it was self funded. I paid. Yeah. The doctor and I that did this study, we paid for everything. We paid for all the drugs. Oh, holy shit. So, and not super expensive, but I okay. I wasn't going to involve a pharmaceutical company. I don't think they really care at this point, right? Drugs was invented Very in the Very smart. 50s. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a crowdfunded study. Yeah, and I didn't want, I also didn't want one of them, if something groundbreaking came out, to then take the credit for this sort of thing. Doesn't make right. a lot of sense, mm -hmm. right? Why well, hand it to, you know, Pfizer or Merck for no reason, so they could claim they found it. Um, yeah. And... What was the, the um, I think Pfizer has some financial incentive not to uh, not to get be these involved. results yeah. published. So yeah. the, um, there goes their recipient formulation. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the gist of why I was looking at this was, it, so on the recipient ester, same as the, uh, an MPP or on Parabon, you have an aromatic ring. And I think mm -hmm. that people that don't have a lot of organic chemistry knowledge misinterpret what those esters look like, right? They're, you said traditionally you would just count the carbons and that gives you the rough days. That it's right. the half life, but the problem is with that aromatic ring, it's much heavier and bigger, and so it's it's changing the way it's broken down, and it actually looks like it's inhibiting the way it's broken down. And my initial, um, I think, influence on this was that there was an, a study that was put out in 1961 on nandrolone, where they compared MPP to nandrolone decanoate, and the the, the end result was that MPP wasn't that efficient of a drug. So they pulled it, Oregon had pulled MPP off the shelves after a year and just went with Tacanoate. Um, that study is difficult. It's not public access. It's difficult to read. There's a lot of calculus in it. There's organic chemistry in it. So the average person is not just going to flip through this thing. Right. And, um, but it, it shows that they've kind of had an idea about this stuff for a long time. It just never really came to light. And it's just Parabon is another example, right? So it's possible that that's not a fantastic ester for Tremblone. You know, it might have kept the levels lower and steady in humans, but compared to acetate, it's just not going to produce the same result. Yeah, maybe that's also why it was pulled off the market, besides the fact that it was produced in a righteous oil, which is inflammatory for some people. <laughs> yeah, so I, but who knows? But I think that that is is the aromatic ring is, the, is kind of the key there, is that you really want to use a straight-chain fatty acid with an ester, ideally. Yeah. Yeah, so for uh, I'll overlay the images of, of uh, testosterone propionate and testosterone inotate. And Dean, you mentioned something in the private chat that it has to do with uh, phosphodiesterase 5D. Which version was it seven, that, that seven, might have a problem B, with this? Seven. So 7B. Phosphodiesterase okay. 7B is the one that we understand as the uh, cleaving enzyme to remove the ester. And... Um, we might have touched on it in a previous episode in the beginning on what I felt that the cypionate five carbon ring might be a little too bulky that it doesn't allow the testosterone molecule with the, the carbonyl part of the ester to enter into the, the binding part of the, the enzyme to remove the ester away. Because at the end of the day, if you think about mm -hmm. it, when you take the ester drug, you're looking for the actual parent compound. It's a pro drug. So testosterone cypionate becomes testosterone. Testosterone enantate becomes testosterone. You're just cleaving that ester away that if you have, like Kurt said, from a, a chemistry perspective, and this is where it's useful of looking at molecules in 3D, and I've done like... Uh, a video before with Kurt where we looked at some molecules in 3D space. The space that's occupied in a 3D dimension with cypionate is a lot different to a five member carbon chain that can actually like twist and contort itself in space to make itself fit. Whereas when you've got this big bulky ring like Kurt is saying in space, it can't really do much. It can like 
maybe rotate and contort a, a tiny bit, but it can't actually squash on itself if that makes sense to fit in. So these long, um, bulky esters, the efficiency of getting into that enzyme is probably a lot lower. And I, I'd said to Kurt, something that might be useful, um, is to find an in silico chemist, a, um, a computational chemist that could do a quick computational model of taking a PDE7B enzyme and computationally working out the binding affinity of it into that pocket versus an antate. And I'd, I'd say the efficiency, the, the, like the binding efficiency of the enante ester into that pocket is probably way higher than cypionate. And from that, you're able to then derive some level of um, uh, drug affinity and then you'll be able to come up with some level of like bioavailability of this is what we would potentially expect with the ester removed for the free drug molecule to enter into serum. So it's... It's really cool um and i mean for anyone watching the results when they are shared it, it is black and white it's pretty to, cool to be 